Greetings, everyone. Pete Puerto here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of In the Prog Seat. That's right. It is Tuesday night. We've got uh, an expanded crew here tonight to talk about uh, two really cool albums. But before we get to the albums, let's introduce the entire staff. And I'm going to kind of introduce everybody in the order that they will be going tonight. So uh, from South London, did I get that correct, Neve? Yes. Neve yes, the Prog Nerd. We've got Chuck Alvarez. From New York, mm -hmm. we've got Armando Venditti from Canada. Our center square tonight is Stephen Reed from Scotland. Hello. Louis Nasser from mm -hmm. Chicago. George mm -hmm. Lamy from Chicago. <laughs> Eric Porter from upstate New York. And I am Pete Pardo from midstate New York. So three New Yorkers, two Chicagoans, two UK folks one Canadian tonight. So tonight's topic of conversation, uh, we're going to kind of continue something we started on the Hudson Valley Squares last week. And this is all about two albums by two very notable bands who had one specific lineup for one album. And then that was it for that lineup. The two contenders today from 1980. Yes, drama. From 19, oh boy, what was this? 86, 87? 86. 86, that's right. Emerson, Lake, and Powell. One and done lineups, one and done records, two pretty notable albums. So uh, we're going to each kind of talk a little bit about what we like or what we don't like about these albums. Do we think that these or feel that these, uh, these configurations could have lasted longer? Should they have lasted longer? Or was this good enough? And that's all we're going to get. And can we live with that? So we're going to get started. We're going to go Neve, Chuck, Armando, Stephen, Lewis, George, Eric, and then myself. So Neve, what about him? Uh, so I'll just start about drama because that was the one that I was new, newer to than the uh, E.L. Powell album. I thought, well, there's two people from the Boggles who are like a pop new wave kind of group. And I thought it'd be a very, very different experience, like not really proggy at all, but I was actually very pleasantly surprised. I actually quite like this album a lot. Prefer the first side. However, second side was a bit, uh, there were like hit or miss spots in the second side of the album parts I thought were a little bit cheesy. Um, but I think overall, I think it did really work. It was a very strange combination, but it really did fit well in a weird way. I don't know why. I, I just really loved it. That all the, the opening was very promising for me. And then it was just, I thought, a really great record throughout. Definitely, I prefer it to the um, Emerson, Lake and Powell record, which I think could have been a lot better considering they had one of the best drummers ever on that record. I think if they spent more time on it, it could have been a lot better. I thought that one was way too cheesy for my liking, um, but I still think it's okay. It's, but I, I think that the drama lineup was a lot better than the ELP, um, Emerson, Lake and Powell record. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, it would have been good for either band to continue on with those lineups, or do you think that kind of like what we got was all we should have gotten? I think with the drama lineup, I think it would have been interesting to hear how they would have progressed because it was like a cool mix of like progressive rock and then new wave as well, which I'm kind of getting into at the moment. I thought it was a cool concept, but I'm worried that if they had taken that into the 80s even further, it could have gotten worse. <laughs> And just more cheesy, but I, I would I would have liked to have seen that. Cool, Chuck. Oh man, well I'm actually um, going to start with uh, Emerson Lake and Powell first. Um, I I had it on vinyl. Actually, I think I still have it on vinyl, if I'm not mistaken. And I was kind of off put by the cheesy sound, the cheesy synth sounds, but um. You know, Cozy Powell, you know, um, I'm of the school of that. This guy was a was a great drummer and probably, in my opinion, probably superior to uh, Carl Palmer, you know, and it's just a shame that the music and the technology at the time didn't fit um, which of this lineup um, which at the time. Um, it had its moments on here, you know, but so there was a couple of songs on here that I did like, um, you know, like the opening track, the first two tracks, actually. And then for me, it just seems to have gotten a bit sappier and sappier. You know, it seems like a lot of bands always come up with a cheesy sounding song and it just deflates the whole album for me. And so, so that, that's what I, that's my take on Emerson Lake and Palmer. Personally, I'm thinking so, I wish that they would have done another album together, but I guess that the Eagles uh, or whatever it was just said no <laughs> to that particular, that particular lineup. 
Now, as far as drama goes, drama is just uh, another continuation of some of the great Yes albums, um, despite, you know, John Anderson not being there, but still a great album. I thought they did very well with this. Um, I, I'm also at the school that I love every song on the album, you know, and one of my favorite songs on, songs on here is uh, Does It Really Happen? You know, and also um, what's uh, Into the Lens as well, and then Machine with Messiah. I mean, I mean um, what's it? I mean, the way it just brings you into the album. Just one superb album. Tempest Fugit can't go wrong with this album. I would go, which I really wish that they could have stayed together for a bit more longer and done some more music together. That's just my take. Very cool. Armando. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I've listened to both albums quite a, uh, quite a few times, actually. I'm, I listened to the uh, ERP, and it's very 80 sounding. You know, uh, the drum sounds on every track sound the same. Not the arrangement of the songs, but the, just the sounds, just the production of it. And very keyboard heavy. Um, no originality. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think they underused Powell on this album to a great extent because he was a monster on the drums. Yep. You know, was. He was a monster. I mean, I heard he played on, um, I had a Brian May Live at the Brixton Academy from 93 album. And he, was a, he was in the touring band. And he just played like a monster, just crazy. Um, the album itself, um, ELP, it just, again, it's a very 80s sounding album with the synths and the, the bass synths and um, versus drama, uh, Untim Drama, I'm sorry. I, I, it's a fantastic album. Uh, Machine Messiah comes out of the gate, grabs you by the throat and doesn't let go. I mean, the guitars come in. It's very guttural, the guitar sound, just very sort of like charging. Right? Um, and I think they could have done with, with Yes, I think they could have done another album with uh, Trevor Horn and Jeffrey Downs. However, the fans didn't want it. You know, the fans didn't want it. I think it, um, because if you listen to the album, um, Chris Squire's vocals are higher in the mix than Horn's, from what I can hear. And he almost, Trevor Horn almost sounds like John Anderson, very slightly, right? So it had all the ingredients to work. It's just, you know, again, the fans didn't want it. Um, and when they toured, I don't believe that they announced uh, the change in the lineup. Yep, that, that was the kicker. People bought yeah. tickets, they go to the venue, and they're like, wait a second. What's John? John Anderson doesn't have big glasses I mean, like that. What, what's try, going on? If you try and deceive the fans, they're going to hand you your ass on the platter and say, get the hell out. You know? Yeah. So I I don't, I, I, I think it could have worked if they were given one more album. Uh, but again, um, it, it, the fans didn't want it. So I mean, the fan spoke and the band listened. So, and they yeah. broke up. But I am team drama. Definitely. So that's, that's three dramas to zero for Emerson, Lake and Powell so far. What's interesting, and I'm sure we'll get into this quite a bit over the course of this discussion, is that if drama had continued on, would we have ever gotten 90125, which was huge, mm -hmm. right? But it's funny because back then, I remember because I was just starting to get into Yes at the time. And I remember like all the old school yes people wanted nothing to do with drama, wanted nothing to do with this lineup. It had to be John Anderson. Yet, how many of them were changing their tune years later because they turns out they hated the Yes West stuff so much that <laughs> in hindsight, many years later, drama now is hailed as an absolute classic. Whereas yeah. back then, everybody's like, no, 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 John Anderson, no yes. People right? are very hard nosed, they're very fickle. They yeah. want what they want. They want familiarity. They want, you know. Yeah. And wasn't Trevor Horn, did he produce 90125 or? Yeah. yeah. He was involved yes. in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He so there you go. Yeah. yeah. 
Stephen, center square. Well, I mean, neither of these albums should make any sense, should they, really? You've got Trevor Horn, you've got Jeff Downs, that's the Buggles. Now, Video Kill the Radio Star, to me, is one of the best singles you're going to find anywhere. But you slam that into Tormato, and that just, that makes no sense at all, right? But then you get Cozy Powell, okay, and I'll read out this little list that I've made. And you've got Michael Schenker, White Snake, Robert Plant, Phenomena, Roger Daltrey, Warlock, Cinderella, Gary Moore, and Forcefield. Those are the albums that Cozy Powell, and, and I'm being a bit selective there, but that's what he drummed on either side of this. And you just think, well, it, none of that really bears any resemblance to this. Drama, it just works. Interestingly, Trevor Horn, to me, sounds like John Anderson. I mean, you wouldn't mistake the two, but if you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't necessarily go, who's that guy? Do you know? And that is not what I anticipated at all when I first heard this album, because it shouldn't have sounded like that at all. Do you know? But if you're looking for that sound, you will find it slightly in here, the bubble sound. You've got uh, Into the Lens, which was reworked by the Buggles later on, on their uh, Adventures in Modern Recording album, uh, as I Am a Camera. And they are similar, but, but different. But I th think if anything, what drama proves to me is that Chris Square and Alan White at this stage were the heart of the band. The bass playing on this album is outstanding. And it leads so much of what's going on that you just can't help but be drawn in by it. I mean, Machine Messiah as an album opener is, I mean, it's nearly Black Sabbath. So, you know, if you crank up the distortion on that opening riff that, that introduces that. this album, it's nearly Tony Iommi. I mean, it's not, but you understand what I mean. It, it kind of knocks you a little bit, but in a really good way, I think. And then you've got something like Run Through the Light, and that's another highlight. Horn, I think he's remarkably Anderson-like on that track. But I think it also highlights the difference between Jeff Downs and Rick Wakeman. Rick Wakeman would be all over that song. He'd be playing yes. everywhere, he'd be darting in and out. And kind of, I think this is almost the album that Steve Howe goes, no, 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 I can take these moments. And Jeff Downs is just happy to lay down some great soundscapes and play for the song. And I like Rick Wakeman. I've spoken about him a lot on, on the shows I've been on and highlighted some of his solo work. But arguably, he just wouldn't have done that. He doesn't play for the song quite so much. And I'm a fan, do you know? So it's interesting. I mean, some somebody's bound to pick up on this down here in the comments. You could argue that this lineup has another album. Because you could argue that they got together on Fly From Here Return Trip because Trevor Horn re-recorded vocals on that. And it is kind of that lineup. It's not really that lineup, it's a construct. They didn't get together and do it. Horn reworked his own things. And it's okay. It's not drama though, you know? And then you get the interesting part that kind of Asia play here because yes, disintegrate, we get something completely different out of them, but you've got how and downs end up in Asia. And supposedly the reason that we end up with Cozy Powell in here is because Carol Palmer was still contractually obliged to be part of Asia for a few months. And it would appear that E and L couldn't wait to have a P, so they had got Powell instead, right? So, and that would appear to be what happened there. And this album shouldn't make any sense either. And it doesn't really, that, that's, that's the difference between the two for me. When this album is good, it's really quite good. The score, it's big and it's bold and it's brash and you know who you're listening to. And Cozy's at home here, you know, doom, bah, ba, doom, da, da, and it's yeah. just in your face and he's hitting it hard. And if you could hit it any harder, he'd break it, do you know? And that's that's what you like to do. And for the benefit of anyone watching from the Hudson Valley Squares, he is Cozy fucking Powell, by the way. So he's allowed <laughs> to hit it hard. Okay. <laughs> he's allowed, right? And then, I mean, you've got Touch and Go, which was used on the TV over here in the UK back at the time. And I really like that song. I just think that it's got a great dynamic. I think it's well arranged. Same again, it's big and it's bold. But when you think about what Powell played on before, 
and then you, see, you hear him on something like Step Aside, which to me is just bad lounge jazz. It's just... Yes, yes. Oh, oh. I, I, it feels like none of them want to be there. It's just, what can we fill this up with, do you know? And it's just bad. To me, anyway, it's just bad. Yeah, and then yeah, you've I got... Agree. Yeah, I, I just... 100%. It's bad, but what's even worse is it's bad and it's catchy. <laughs> I finished the album and I find myself singing it. <laughs> I like it. Arguably, it's well written, but I just I can't take it at all. Not for them, then, right? Not for yeah, them. Oh, not from them. No, I mean I wouldn't listen to it by anybody really, but not from them. Do you know? Um, and then you've got Mars of Bringing a War, which is arguably the most ELP, E.L. Palmer track on the whole thing. You know, it's a classical piece reworked, and, and it just makes sense in all those ways. And suddenly you feel at home. Cozy doesn't stand out. I would say, whether you like one or the other, I would say Carol Palmer's a percussionist. I would say Cozy Pearl's a drummer. And I think there's quite a big difference between the two. And, I mean, I don't know if anybody else has got the addition I've got this with bonus tracks on. Mm, I have. Been, so has, has everybody else, <clears throat> at some point in the last few weeks, sat through the locomotion? Have they? Please tell me they have, because if I've suffered it, you I've should tried. <laughs> oh, I've tried. I've tried. Oh. <laughs> I had to go to the bathroom when I heard it. Sorry, I had to stop. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. It's almost like somebody got a, a school kids choir and gave them a set of keyboards and said, "What would you like to do? Play a popular song, and we'll stick it on the end of this album." It's terrible. It's absolutely. It really is. Oh. I prefer the Kylie Minogue version. That's how bad it was. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Mean, I'll I'm go over sorry. That. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> it hurt. And that is not something, before, it hurt. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and that's not something we're going to profess too often on this show, is it? Right. No, 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 no. For, for me, Emerson <laughs> Lake and Powell is the best AOR album that Emerson Lake and whoever made. But that's not what you want from them, is it? You could well, also argue it's the best thing that they did for oh, post brain salad surgery. Yeah. Arguably, maybe. I mean, it's a step up from Love Beach, or it, or it is from me. But out of the two, it has to be that. It has to be drama. Um, I like it a lot. Is it one of my favourite Yes albums? Yeah, On the Right Day it is. Uh, and this has been a pleasure to revisit and listen to over and over and over. I've listened to it much more than I really needed to, and I've listened to that as much as I needed to. So that tells you that I'm, I'm also in team drama. So I want to bring up a point. Neve mentioned something before about, yes, incorporating a little bit of the growing new wave scene on that album. Does anybody else hear, I never once thought about it, but when I was listening to it uh, yesterday, I hear a little bit of like Todd Rundgren's Utopia, circa like uh, um, Road to Utopia. Yeah. Does anybody oh, hear elements of that at all in, in that album? Actually, um, 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 what's it, the um, drama? What's the um I yeah, actually you can um yeah I can hear it mm -hmm. especially with a couple of songs so some of their more popular songs the songs that are influenced by um like run for the out. lights and you know does it really happen you know kind of quirky mm -hmm. I don't know I'm reminded of that same period utopia I don't know mm -hmm. yeah, I could I I agree there mm -hmm. kind of yeah but Rundgren is a lot crazier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's that whole pop I thing right? it, i don't think he was ever as neatly polished mm. so i don't know i mean there's more song structure on drama versus yeah versus oh, yeah, true yeah, yeah. Utopia. I mean, more of like a feel not to say that Tom yeah, Rundgren yeah. doesn't know how That's to write true. a song he really but it's a different kind of vibe i think it's that Rundgren is a little more nuts and in, in a good way, you know. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's what we like. Yeah. Right? And I think they both have a catchiness that maybe even Yes didn't have on some things as an entire album. I mean, I think mm -hmm. most of the songs on this are, they catch you right away. I mean, they have hooks, even though mm -hmm. they're the vocals and everything, which Todd, oh, no matter what Todd was doing musically, you could always connect. Um, you know, he was always melodic, no matter what was going on musically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. I agree. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, Lewis, are we going to continue right. on? It's four nothing in favor I, of drama. Let, let me give my, my view, and this is going to cost me endless trouble, but I don't care. Um, 
for me, um, and this I know this is just me, but for me, when I first heard drama, I had I had a double take because I, I really, really liked it. And I and my first impression with Yes Records, with very few exceptions, was that they were awesome instrumental parts, but then they had these horrible singing parts. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. You know where I'm going with this. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I had the additional misfortune of reading the lyrics, which I know most people say the lyrics don't matter. But for me, they matter a lot. And I, I just can connect with any of them. I mean, I, I, I lived in Mexico City and there's no unicorns and, and things like that prancing about. So for me, it's not really part of my experience. <laughs> Black Sabbath was part of my experience. Johnny Blade lived two, two houses away from me. So I, I kind of get that, you know, and, and, and yes, just miss me by a mile. But when I heard this record, even though the lyrics are still a little askew, the music was very well put together. So to my way of thinking, yes, was basically John Anderson comes up with a little pop tune and then the band shows up and they write this complicated prog arrangement that incorporates the prog. And it's, it's basically the same formula that Dream Theater uses, but Dream Theater does like a ballad and then they stick like all this <laughs> cool music to it, right? And, um, and it works, when it works, it works brilliantly. But I think that Yes always benefited from changing pieces. Like when Relayer came out, that had a, a something to it that was great even though of course rick wakeman is a phenomenal keyboard player mm -hmm. and i think that with drama um I, I, I would never say it sounds like sabbath but i would say that's the first record we hear steve howe play distortion pedal mm -hmm. and suddenly it's very shocking because you're accustomed to a guitar tone that sounds like the man threw the guitar in his driveway and then did a couple and then he plugs it in to get that very earthy tone it's not usually what he's known for. He's known for very beautiful acoustic playing mm -hmm. and for a very thin, brittle, acoustic electric tone. That's his sound, right? And here he has a very refined electric sound that is not to be found anywhere before or after, True. right? Because later you had Rabin and Rabin is a monster guitar player and he had a he lot did. of things that really complemented the other stuff, right? <clears throat> so I... And I have to say, I love, 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 and I've always been a fan of Yes, primarily due to the bass playing and the drums. Mm -hmm. To me, that is just, a band is only as good as its drummer and is only as excellent as rhythm section because everything else needs a foundation, right? You can always tell- Spoken from I the bass player himself. Exactly. <laughs> the, the, the best bass players are, are not making themselves too known. Even if they play busy lines, and that was some of what Chris Squire was known for. He played busy, but he allowed a lot of room for all the other stuff, all the twiddly bits to happen, right? <laughs> and I, I think that drama is a beautifully put together record. I think it has, it extends the idea of let's make coherent compositions. You know, they're a little bit longer. And all the catchiness and all that that you had from before is, is present here, but in a more organized way. I really, really love drama. I think it's a beautiful record. And uh, I, I say that without any reservation. I think it's a great album, top to bottom, right? It's beautiful. Now, E.L. E. Powell. The only reason I bought that record in 86 is because it had the name Cozy Fucking Powell. Mm -hmm. Because I was of the, gotta do it. I was at the Rainbow School I really and all the hard rock. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. This is where I grew up with metal, hard rock. This is my this was my jam. I came into Prague a lot later, right? And so, um, you know, I wasn't really familiar with their music at that time. I hadn't really heard all the other stuff. And um, what I what I thought of that record is that it had um, really brassy sounding keyboards and it had a lot of ballads but then it had a song like touch and go and in hindsight if you were to orchestrate it using a slightly distorted hammond 
and you were to give it a, a different vibe and you, and you put a little fuzz on the bass and you just gave it a little bit of extra aggression, but you leave Cozy Powell. I would argue that that would be a classic ELP track. You're probably right. Mm-hmm. And and I would say the same thing about some of, so, I mean, Mars, the bringer of war, that is a an iconic piece of music. And I, I mean, even the Devil's Staircase, we did a, our own version of that mm-hmm. with synth sax and all kinds of other crazy stuff for the Devil's Staircase. It's such a, it's such a beautiful, that, that ostinato in 5-4, you know, that, that pulse that keeps it going and then how the, the, the chords start to, you know, call an answer. It's just a beautiful, beautiful composition. There is an important difference between Cozy Powell and um, Kyle Palmer. And that big difference is that Cozy Powell is not at war with a metronome. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if you have the chance to hear any recordings of that band on those tours, when they play the, the classic ELP tracks, they have an incredible sound. Because Cozy Powell gives it, it, it doesn't feel like a frantic, I'm going to hit everything I can as fast as I can all the time. Mm-hmm. Right? It sounds like I don't have to prove anything to anyone. I'm just going to play the drums of this song and I'm going to play them well. And I'm going to propel it and I'm going to give it a lot of heft. Because that's what Cozy fucking Powell does, right? Mm-hmm. Heft, yep. yep. And as a result, when you hear those versions of those songs, first of all, the tempo doesn't sound like they've all been doing a lot of cocaine. It's a lot more controlled. And secondly, the music, even though some of the, the keyboard sounds are very unfortunate, everybody was trying to explore the new thing, right? Everybody always talks about Prague. Prague is about exploration and going forward. Well, these guys saw new instruments and they wanted to try them. And all they got was flagged for it, right? How dare you change? You're supposed to be <laughs> Prague. You're supposed to play a Hammond and nothing else or a piano. Mm-hmm. Maybe a Mellotron. Well, you know, so it's it's one of those cases where damned if you do, damned if you don't. But to me, and I also had the opportunity to play in a Emerson, Lake and Palmer tribute. But fortunately, I was not the singer because nobody wants to pay for that. But I, I got a chance to study all the music from Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And I was able to then play bass that didn't have to be a simplified version of Emerson's left hand because I didn't have to sing. I could actually play a bass part that made sense in the context of the music Mm -hmm. without the limitation of having to be this great singer that has to sing, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I have never learned more music than than I did during those three years that I studied Emerson's compositions. It's really not, it's really, um, the originality of that man's brain and how he applied harmonic concepts to the music is something that I hadn't realized until I had to learn it to play it. And at me having to learn that music to play it was sometimes the first time I ever heard some of these classic albums, like I really heard them, right? I had heard Welcome to the Show, right? Welcome my friends and all that, but I had never heard the full Carnival Nine, all three parts put together. And I had to hear them and then I had to study them. I had to digest them. I had to be able to play them live without mistakes, right? And I didn't have to look like I was counting. I had to know it, I had to feel it. And you realize that uh, Keith Emerson was was really a genius. He really was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unlike uh, unlike anybody, in my opinion, you know, and yes, the compositions were a lot more sophisticated even though they took a turn towards uh, the commercial, right? Everybody, you know, I think that when people try to to stop doing what's their passion and they start trying to pursue what the fans want, that's when you start to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think that that those guys were having with that. That's the problem that that Miles Davis had at some point and he looked at these pop bands and realized, well, how come these guys have all the cash? Mm-hmm. I want some of that cash. Yep. Then when, when Prague stopped being super, you know, commercial, because it was very commercial for a while, mm-hmm. these guys felt the need to still, you know, play to big stadiums and get big checks because they had big expenses, right? Big expensive divorces, big drug bills. They had a lot of big <laughs> receipts coming in. Oh, and, they, yeah. and they had to, to they, they just felt, well, let's just do what we've always done. Let's try to be popular, right? 
and that it turns out it doesn't work. It turns out that not even Paul McCartney can just snap his fingers and come up with a number one, right? It's very much like everything in life, a matter of timing. It's a matter of being in the right place at the right time. And I think that um, had, had E.L. Powell stayed together, I think that the, the band presence live would have helped them regain some of the old bass because they just had to get past the idea that if it's not Carl Palmer, it's not good. Or if it's not John Anderson, it's not good. You just have to judge it for what it is, right? And um, I know that's, that's something that most people are not willing to do, but I, I think that's a mistake. I, I think that the E.L. Powell album has a lot of filler, without a doubt. Perhaps more filler than some of the older records, but I don't think it's in any way worse than Love Beach. Quite the old, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. right? and that's the three original guys, mm -hmm. and then they came back together and did some other very regrettable albums too, right? So, from my perspective, do I think it's a shameful record? No, no. Um, do I think that it holds its own? Um, yeah, I, I do think that. I, I think that arrangement is everything, and and I, I insist if a lot of those songs had used the the instrumental palette of the debut, right? With Cozy Powell, we'd be having a totally different conversation because mm -hmm. a lot of the comes from the choice of sounds. Those very artificial sounding keyboards, which very sound sterile. great. It's very when sterile. You're, yeah, when, when you're in a different context, they, they work, right? But even mm -hmm. Devo used less, less, uh, I mean, more authentic sounding, angry, buzzy sounds. These guys went for the, like the, 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 the first preset that sounded like brass, that's the one, right? <laughs> and and yeah. it's, it's unfortunate that they did that. And but, they held on to it for the whole album. Yeah, I mean, that's right. And, and, and I don't know who produced it, but whoever did that deserves to get a kick in the ass. Lake did just, it. <laughs> well, there you go. So I, I'm just saying there's a, there's a, I, I like that. I like both albums. I have to give it to Yes, though. I think the Yes album, is an album that I gladly listen to a lot, but the E.L. Powell is a record that I I enjoyed studying. I, I, as a musician, I love listening to it. I, I, I think that if you really want to learn harmony, you could do a lot worse than the Emerson compositions, right? And, and I mean, I think E.L.P. are similar to Yes in the way that that um, Greg Lake would write a little song which was really not a little song. Not, I don't mean it in a bad way, but it's a, a short pop tune with a hook. And then they, you know, they had to kind of arrange it and build music around it. If you listen to Take a Pebble, that is credited to Greg Lake. I'm sorry, Greg Lake did not write all those piano runs. He did not write any of the, the majority of the tracks. He did not do that. He didn't. He did not. So the way they did their credits is very misleading. It's okay. But I think that while I also admire Greg Lake enormously as a singer and as a musician and as a composer, I have to give it to Emerson. So it's that guy deserves a lot of, of respect in my book. And um, but that album is not as consistently great as drama for me. So while I while I, I have to give it to drama, it's not by a, by a lot, because I think that if you truly listen to the record, and, and break it apart and see what they're doing, right? And listen, it's not bad music. It's just very unfortunate choices of sound. The, the, the sounds is what bothered me, really. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but but again, and I and I can tell you this with confidence because we, I, I during a rehearsal, I, I did, um, I suggested to our keyboard player Brian Harris, who's this monster keyboard player, because he does all the Emerson stuff and he does it, you know, note for note that we should play that um, touch and go, but he should use the old sounds. Oh. Don't go for the cheesy, brassy thing. Go for the go for the throat. And it's a different tune, right? It really changes. So that's what I have to say. I, I think that kind of like some of, like Jethro Tull, Broadsword and the Beast, it's, it's a brilliant album. I love that record. And people don't necessarily love it because they hate some of those keyboardy things. Well, what can I do? But it's a brilliant album, right? And I think that whole era had all these guys trying the new instruments and trying to be trying to progress. And they people didn't like it. 
So the, 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 the thing for me about the, the progression is that Emerson, Lake and Powell didn't try to on this album. That's what strikes me. I mean, there's a lyric early on in the score, not early on, but at the end of the score, so the opening track, Welcome Back My Friends to the Show That Never Ends. That, that was then, surely this is now. Do you know, do we need sure. to go and reference things from before? And I mean, surely when you introduce someone like Cozy Powell into the lineup, you're right for what you've got. Yes. You make, you make that album work for who's going to play on it. And Cozy Powell was going to play on that album. So why did he make three songs sound like he was meant to be on them? And the rest of the album doesn't sound like he was meant to be on them. He's totally wasted. He'd be as I, well not, not even showing up for, for half of this album. And Stephen, then you look at think, Yes. Stephen, do you think he was underused? Oh, massively, very, yeah. Very it was an opportunity for Emerson, Lake and Powell to become a muscular musical beast. That's right. To really go out and make a grand and bold statement that we would all be looking at now and going, wow, I'd never had anything like that from them before. They always had the potential, but there's the power, there's the beast, there's the animal. And, and they just, they shied away, they ran away from that. Whereas I yes, think, because I, for me, yes, it would appear to be the masters of evolution. How many great albums from Yes have we got from different lineups? And that yeah. is the difference, right for who's in the band. Right. Don't write because this is what we sound like. And I think Emerson, Lake and Powell is an attempt in 1986, which was filled with cheesy keyboard sounds, to sound like E. LP, and it's really hard to knock off the notion, and I know that Powell is friends with the bands and, and all that sort of stuff, but it's hard to knock off the notion that he's Emerson Lake and some drummer that starts with the letter P. And I know it's not that, right. but I, 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 it would have been better if it was Emerson Lake and somebody else entirely, do you know what, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you see, to me, it just seemed like they were using Cozy Powell and again, let's be honest, he's Cozy fucking Powell. I mean, yeah. he's a monster. And I think it was my two senses. They were just using him as a filler because, again, Palmer was doing Alpha with Asia at the time, right? I mean, Cozy's like, a big name, Armando. You're mm -hmm. absolutely true. I mean, he's, he's a yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Rainbow Rising, hello. <laughs> and, you know, like, and others, it's just like, and he's, he had a solo career as well, I believe, at that at yeah. that point, right? But I just feel like they were using, like he wrote none of the songs on the album. It was all, um, you know, Emerson and Lake, and it just feels like, okay, this is what we want you to do. This is the, this is the pattern we want you to play, and keep up. The, this is the tempo, and it's like, okay, well, where's my coffee? Kind of thing. He's playing, you know what I mean? Like, well, I mean, to Stephen's point, if you listen to his playing on Slide It In mm -hmm. and the second MSG album, mm -hmm. the Black Sabbath albums that come after this, it's like night and day, right? I mean, oh. you don't hear any of that fleeting right. on this album. It's like he's been put in a box, you know? It's almost like half his drum kit's been moved away from him. You know, I'll never forget him being on record breakers in the UK, and he was breaking the record for the most drums hit in three minutes or whatever it was, and he was running around the studio just hitting things for <laughs> literally no apparent reason. <laughs> but that's the sort of guy that Cozy Powell was. He was willing to go on to the BBC and run about on kids' television to get himself in the Guinness World Book of Records for just hitting drums running about a studio. That was Cozy Powell. And then you hear him on, on this album, and it couldn't just be anybody else. I mean, there are some of those little drum breaks that, in two or three of the songs that you think, ah, that's Cozy Powell. But it's two or three drum breaks. Mm. That's all. I mean, why would you wheel in one of the best rock drummers of the time and say, mm, just do this? Mm. Just do I, that. I would argue, you're absolutely right. And I, I would argue that Keith Emerson gave himself the same restrictions. Yeah. Mm. He doesn't play uh, like he did on The Barbarian. No. <laughs> he doesn't play like he did in, you know, in, in so many of the classic tunes. I mean, Carnival 9, you know, second impression. That's not there either. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. they, were, they were trying to go for what was commercially viable. Yep. And they suddenly had a steady drummer who was not going to hit everything that was hittable on site <laughs> all the time, as fast as possible. Yeah. It, was a, it was a different thing. And I, and I think that 
you know, it changes the dynamic. The drummer changes, it changes everything. So it was suddenly, they needed some adjusting. I think it would have been helpful for them to spend a little longer in the, in the studio making the album, writing material. And, and, and that's a band that I think would have definitely benefited from a second go. Where, mm-hmm. where even Cozy Powell himself may have been a little bit more vocal about, you know, listen, guys, enough of this. Like, mm-hmm. uh, we have to hit. Because as we saw, he has, he had the capacity to do that exactly. on more than so, one occasion, right? Yeah. You know, he, he was not known for being a prog drummer. Mm-hmm. Right. So it makes sense that he wanted to, you know, it's, 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 it's one thing to have the muscle memory and just the chops to play in syncopations and everything in four. It's another thing to start doing these things in multiple time signatures. It turns out that there were no multiple time signatures in this record. It's very straightforward. But there was know. also no, um, no muscle, right? But I think that's also to do with the arrangements. It's also to do with what they were trying to accomplish. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's just unfortunate that every many, many people from the 70s were in that mindset in the 80s that they just needed to sell. Yep. move yep. shift units sell we need cash yeah that's yep. that's too bad but i agree with you it is a huge waste cozy uh-huh. Powell, i mean on paper it sounds like should have been monumental right mm-hmm. and that's maybe huge. the nail being hit on the head field though is that emerson lake and powell sounds like a cash grab drama sounds like a band trying to prove something mm-hmm. try to go yeah it does <laughs> elp emerson lake and powell does sound like a cash grab Mm-hmm. You know, because ELP, you know, Palmer, Powell. I mean, it's, you know, it's fillable. I mean, we can put someone else in there with the last name of Powell. I mean, but you've got this massive talent, and then then I'll shut up and we'll move on. I'm sorry. But you've got this massive talent in Powell. They don't use them, yeah. you know? And, and I mean, it's just like, what the hell? I mean, it's just, I don't know. Lack of originality is the only thing I can say about that. <laughs> I mean, they grabbed the big name. Yes, grabbed two guys, which nobody really knew. Took a chance, right? Yeah. So they both kind of took different avenues to get where they got. So, yeah. all right, George, your take on these albums. Well, I'll go with the Yes first, because that's the one I heard first. I didn't start collecting their records till the mid-'80s. Uh, I was spurred on by a couple of friends of mine that were brothers and the guy at the local vinyl shop. And all three of them were telling me ahead of time, qualifying the drama, I had the two different guys, you know, this is something I got to know about. So, okay, I go into it with that mindset and I, I found that it didn't bother me. I mean, they were both close enough where I wouldn't say they're as good as who they replaced, but it's, they were in the neighborhood, you know, it didn't affect my enjoyment of the music. Uh, like everybody already said, Machine Messiah, to me, if it's not a top 10 yes track, it's right outside the periphery of that. And there's other good songs on there. There's no real stinkers. I mean, it was a solid record. I thought that then, I still think it now. Um, I feel it's almost a, what I would call an underrated, overrated record. It's got this big rep for being underrated, and it's almost overrated to me now, like Everyone wants to say it's underrated, but I don't think it is. I think it holds a, not a top five yes record, but it's, you know, in somewhere between six and 10. That's where it should be. The ELP, I never heard it back in the day. I just heard Touch and Go, and I dismissed it because, yeah, the, everyone said the keyboard tones are so cheesy. But a couple recent revisits, and uh, my two main things that I come away with on this one are First of all, it's false advertising because it, it's supposed to be a prog rock band and I'm not hearing a lot of prog rock on this record. The yeah. first track, I like the score. I like Mars, although Symphony X did it a lot better. But the <laughs> stuff in between, especially the stuff on the second side of the vinyl, I, just come on. I mean, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, the gated drum sounds, the keyboard tones that are of the time, unfortunately, you can't go back and change them but they are what they are. I mean, it's not pleasant for me, for my taste to listen to that record uh, outside of those couple songs that I mentioned, the score and uh, Mars. Um, So for me, I am definitely a vote for drama on this one. Six to nothing. Mm -hmm. All right, Eric. Brother Eric. (laughs) Well, I kind of... um 
kind of the same as George, when I started getting into progressive was around 85 or 86. So I had gotten introduced to it by a, a guy I was playing music with and he was a big fan of progressive music. So I, I again, didn't have any investment in these bands or any preconceived notions. I knew the radio songs. I think I had Fragile, didn't have any other Yes records, didn't have any ELP. Um, and as I, you know, I was hoping I could get some credibility for this, but I did see the Emerson, Lake and Powell um, tour mm -hmm. in 86, about 35 years ago to the day. Um, oh. mm -hmm. It was uh, September 9th, 86. So we're almost there. But, um, and I remember walking out of that show it was my first progressive band that I ever saw live. And I remember being very impressed from the live show. But listening to the record, I went back and listened to it for this show, and I haven't listened to it probably in 30 something years. And I tried to think of what songs do I remember? I remembered Touch and Go, that lick or keyboard pattern came back to me. I remember seeing the video all the time. I knew they did Mars, but I didn't remember their version of it. So when I went back and listened to it, um, I think the record is fairly forgettable. Um, like everyone else has said, between the bad sounding keyboards, which is really a disappointment with Emerson. And I think it's a lot of Greg Lake songs that just don't do anything. They're, you know, Love Blind or whatever that one is. They just, they're not good. Um, in terms of, you know, the replacing the band members, again, you know, you could almost look like Bruford and White. They're different drummers. Um, both are excellent. And I like Lewis's point where Carl Palmer's, Carl Palmer's very busy. I'm not a drummer, but I've heard a lot of people say that he's not the best timekeeper in the world. Mm -hmm. So he's a very busy drummer, whereas Cozy Powell comes in and here's the hammer, here's the nail, mm -hmm. but he also has finesse. Mm -hmm. What I hear on this record from him is the hammer and the nail. I don't hear any finesse. I, it's almost like they said, we don't want any fills just play to this and this is what you're gonna do. I mean, that's just my take on it. I feel like everyone else did. He was underutilized uh, for whatever reason. Um, and it just, the record doesn't do anything for me. And conversely, Drama was the second Yes record that I bought. So my buddy would make me these mixtapes. And I remember specifically Machine Messiah and Tempest Fugit were the first two songs on this mixed tape he gave me. I ran out and bought Drama, and it's been one of my favorite Yes records ever since. I love this record. Um, it's one of the ones I go to. Interestingly enough, probably Relayer and Drama are the ones I play the most now. With the two um, odd whole lineups, right? Yep. Yeah, it's yep. very heavy for Yes. It's almost like you had Hal, White, and Squire in the studio writing these songs. And then I think Lewis even mentioned this too, where Downs comes in. There's a lot of keyboards on this album, but it's almost like they wrote this as a trio and then brought Trevor Horn and Jeffrey Downs in. But uh, Machine mm -hmm. Messiah kills me every time I hear it. Chris Squire, this is Chris Squire's record to me. Great bass lines all the way through this record. And they're singing on it too. You know, they sound great been... together. And I know, again, we've all said they're very comparable, Trevor Horn and Anderson, but I think they mesh perfectly. I love Squire's voice on this record. I think he sings great. I think his bass playing, the bass lines are phenomenal. Um, each song almost has a distinctive bass line to it. I always call it I Am A Camera too. I know it's into the lens, mm -hmm. but and every song has too. this great bass line. And I just, and I didn't know this. I went out and read, and if I'm wrong, correct me, but I think Trevor Horn actually plays bass on the uh, Run Through the Light. He does, yeah. Yeah. fretless, I think, right? And it's got that little fretless bass, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's a little different, um, but, I love this record. It's one of my favorite Yes records to this day. Um, yes. I would have loved to heard more from um, the drama lineup, Emerson, Lake, and Powell. They would have had to do a lot of work to get me to listen to anything else by then. So my vote is for drama. Mm -hmm. It's interesting um, saying that that lineup would have to make you work really hard because that's actually the first ELP album I heard. Can you believe that? <laughs> uh, I, can, I was I was 13 when that came out and I borrowed the cassette from the local library. Took it home thinking this is this could be prog, this could be prog. 
and it was about 10 years until I kind of thought, you know what, I really should try and get into this band that everyone keeps talking about. <laughs> it's, it's funny because... There you go. <laughs> I think, Stephen, I might have been the same. I mean, outside of Carnival and Lucky Man, I don't think I owned an ELP record, and I bought that record because we got tickets to see the show. So I bought the Emerson, Lake, and Powell record because we were going to that. I knew their radio hits, but I didn't... I don't think I owned any albums of theirs at that time. But, but you know... This, I think everybody's been talking about something that is very interesting. Um, if you think about a song like Lucky Man, it's not the greatest song in the world. Not. <laughs> it's not, not at all. <laughs> it, it's a song that Greg Lake wrote when he was a, a teen. Mm -hmm. And they needed an extra song and they threw it on that record. And then, uh, you know, Keith Emerson told the story at an air fest where he was trying to twiddle with the keyboards that they just arrived in the studio. And they had this rule in the band that whoever produced had final say on, on, on everything. Mm -hmm. So Emerson told the audience that he was twiddling on the keyboard, trying to, trying to get the oscillator just right. And they recorded him, unknown to him, <laughs> with a playback. And that legendary solo is him just twiddling. It's like, hmm, this song is missing something. <laughs> and that, that thing has haunted him forever because he hates it. He's like, no, 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 let me, let me have a go now. No, that's I'm it. with him. I don't like it either. I was never with him. It's a horrible thing. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's almost comical about it. And, um, but everybody loves it. And, um, you know, the, the, I mean, Keith Emerson is a guy who was full of really funny stories. I was lucky to, 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 to get to know Andre Shomonli, who, um, who was his tech. He, I'll just tell one quick story, which I thought was hilarious. He went back when he was trying to date the, the Japanese girl that ended up being with him and being his couple for many years. She, they were, they were apparently somewhere in Tokyo and she was a little bit, you know, bored because he was just such a, such an old guy that didn't want to have fun. And she, she said, you know, you have to do something fun with me, man. So she talked him into doing karaoke. And Keith Emerson decided to go with this girl that he really cared about. I said, all right, I'll, I'll do karaoke for you. You know, besides nobody here knows me, so I'm safe. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they walk to this place and they, they go through the list and they had, you know, welcome back, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and the way the story was told to me, I never met Keith Emerson. So I, this is not, this is secondhand from Andre, but what, what apparently happened, they, he started the song. And as the song started, all these complaints of Greg Lake started filling Keith Emerson's head. Oh yeah, this is a pretty fast tempo. Oh, this is like an uncomfortable key to sing in. And all these things were happening. And he basically murdered his own song. <laughs> and then he's, he's doing the walk of shame back to his table. And, um, and, and one guy who was a, a Japanese suited guy told him, that was terrible. <laughs> and the other guy says, he knows, he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> So this one came to me from Andre. You know, but it, it, oh, one of those guys, you know, I, I really wish I had a chance to have met him just to thank him for all the music that I had learned just from studying his stuff. Like it's, sure. it's an incredible mind, you know, like there's a few of them, like, like Emerson, Mike Keneally, these guys who just have this unique brain. But yeah, the record is terrible. And just I mean, like, like Powell was <laughs> underutilized I, I would we're, say that, we're that that Jeff Downs is a little bit out of his depth playing the older stuff. If you guys have ever had the experience of seeing Yes play, he's always struggling. You know, mm -hmm. he's trying to catch up. He's never quite on it. He's always a little what, a beat or two behind. You know, so all this adds up to the why drama was so wonderful. He's not expected to be a Rick Wakeman. He's, he's right. just being himself. Right. And it works beautifully. But yeah. once you start to ask him to do all the things that he doesn't do, he's then it all that falls guy. apart. Yeah, he's oh. not that guy. He's not yeah. that guy. And there's no shame in not being that guy because who he is is perfectly fine. Right. But he can't really adequately, you know, convincingly and comfortably play all that other catalog. He just can't. And I know people are going to hate me and say, who the hell do you think you are to say this? But have you guys been to these shows? Yeah, I've seen them. I'm yeah, just saying, right. I, 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 don't, I don't have anything against the man. I've, I've met him. He's a very nice fellow. But, you know, 
the music speaks for itself, right? Mm-hmm. That's all. I'm, that's all I have to say. So it is unfortunate on both sides. You know, you have to find your level, like water, and stick with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So for, for balance, Peter, you really have to like the Emerson Lake and Powell album now, don't yeah. you? <laughs> it's not you know? no, 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 I'm afraid. I'm afraid to say this is a complete shutout today. So let me give my quick take on this whole thing. So uh, this is actually the first Yes album I ever bought. I bought this when it first came out. Uh, I came very close to seeing them live at Madison Square Garden, but it it did sell out pretty quickly. And yes, I heard the stories from people who went, who came back and were like, oh, God, we went there and there was no John Anderson. I don't know who this guy was, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, and I forget who actually said it. it might have been Armando. Anyway, this the, the fans did not want this line. They didn't want not want a yes without John Anderson. Now and, uh, they basically got what they asked for, right? Because mm-hmm. unfortunately, as great as this album is, uh, that's all we saw. And uh, it's a shame. I will say I like this top to bottom. It has given me lots of enjoyment throughout my life. I loved it when it came out. I still like it. Is, is it a top three yes album? Maybe not. Is it a top five? Could very well be. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has Steve Howe's best guitar tone on any album. He used all sorts of different guitars, but it didn't matter. It all sounded spectacular. Uh, I agree with Lewis. Great to hear him step on the distortion box for once, right? Yeah. It's not that hard, dude. Just, you know, just let me <laughs> hit that button. Hit that button. Um, the bass playing is great. The vocals are great. It's just a really engaging album. It's got great artwork. There's a reason why the band has revisited this album, you know, the current incarnation has revisited this album quite a bit in recent years because the fans want to hear it and the band wants to play these songs. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, this is a no brainer of an album to kind of circle back. Should it have continued? I would have liked to have seen another album out of this one. I would have. Uh, But in, in doing that, you arguably then don't get uh, Asia and you don't get 90125. So, you know, sometimes you can't really mess with history. Right. But uh, you know, so there's that. Uh, this. <clears throat> I listened to this at the gym today. And I was amazed at how often I wanted to skip ahead throughout it and just get through it as quickly as possible. I like parts of it. I think the score is pretty terrific. Uh, Learning to Fly, eh. The Miracle is a good kind of poppy track, you know? I like Greg's vocal on that. Touch and Go is really good, obviously. Mm-hmm. I agree with everything Lewis said. Change the sound a little bit. Use maybe a Hammond or something else. Have Cozy be cozy. We, we might be talking about that being a legendary song. Uh, Mars is, is really good. The rest of it's pretty forgettable. The locomotion is horrible. Uh, I, was, I, I sat through like a minute and a half of it this morning. I'm like, please let me hear the Grand Funk Railroad version immediately <laughs> which i kind of like anyway so um <laughs> you know it's not produced very well i think there's good emerson playing on it but unfortunately it just sounds awful it's just so 80s and this should have been enormous I, I, it really should have and as it stands it's kind of forgettable unfortunately um yeah so it's to be drama. fair though you listen to it at the gym that may have had something to do with you wanting to skip ahead. <laughs> yeah, because no, I don't yeah, man, so. I want to be motivated a little bit. I was like, yeah. man, I'm just looking for more. I don't think so. I think yeah. 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 All right, so I have, before we go, I have one little twist for everybody. Um, so obviously our winner today is drama. So yeah. now, and you don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. Would you pick this over Relayer? Neve. Uh. No, I love Relay way too much. Because <laughs> <laughs> again, that's another one and done lineup, right? I mean, and that's yeah. that also is very notable for a lot of reasons. Both are fantastic, but I'd still I'd pick Relay over hundred percent. I mean, Mr. Moraz. I mean, I think we all could agree we we would love to see more with him in the band. Mm-hmm. I oh, would have anyway. Well, yeah. yeah, Chuck. Not in a chance. <laughs> What's as much as I love drama, um, Relay is like a top two in my book. Mm-hmm. Mm. Armando. Relayer. Steven. Relayer probably pushes to be my number one or number two album from Yes. So it's it's Relayer for me as well. Lewis. 
I don't want to cop out, but are, are they comparable just because the sticker says yes? <laughs> which would you rather listen to, though? Yeah, which would it depends rather? what I'm doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, let's be fair. It's, 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 um, I, I love Relayer. I absolutely love Relayer, right? So there's no there's no shame in, 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 in any any part of that record, but but it is drama is just a different listening experience, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, if you're gonna have the chance to sit down and listen very clearly to everything, then you're gonna go with Relayer because you need to pay attention. There's a lot of statistical density. Even though you've heard <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening, right? Yeah. yeah. Drama is, is more of an easy listening yeah. familiar i want to connect with my childhood kind of experience so i i can't really pick it's not i'm not you know it really depends what i'm doing i mean for me drama is more intuitively <laughs> obvious and, and familiar and clear relayer is a little bit like homework but it's really enjoyable homework yeah it is. this is how i would put it george hell no relayer in a landslide <laughs> <laughs> eric all right, I'm going to break the shutout then. Um, and I had mentioned before, Relayer and Drama are the ones I've been going to the most. I like Drama better. And I love Relayer, so mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of drama. Yeah. yeah, I would probably lean towards Relayer too. Not by a lot, but I... Relayer for me probably sits just behind Close to the Edge is my favorite ESL. Same. Yes. Yeah. I agree. I know I do too. There is an intensity with Relayer that I don't think you get on any other Yes album. What it maybe lacks in is uh, those catchy melodies and whatnot, although there is some of them. I think Relayer is the album that the band really wanted to make, and it showed them as some pretty damn great players, right? Uh, if they didn't show it already. Um, you could tell they were listening to their Mahavishnu and Return to Forever albums, oh, right? Oh, yes, um, most definitely. Now, and, vice, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine, though, if Steve Howe had actually found, you know, that tube screamer? He needed it, man. Right. He needed it. Come on. He like... it for Relayer. <laughs> Could you imagine if he had a little, just a little I'm bit of overdrive say, on sound? We would have a totally oh, different discussion, right? Yep. Because mm -hmm. yep. then that would just be, like, mind-blowing awesome. Yeah. It would I even operate the, the little chance of soon. Yeah, mm -hmm. it would be just like it, it would make them stuck bigger contrast between the other stuff, even right? I, yeah, so yeah. I got a question to put out there because a very quick question there's been you know all this talk on the chat, and I've had this talk with a, a friend of mine about how bands should stay together. That if, um, if, a, if, a, if a member leaves, it's no longer the band. Okay, the question is. Should a band stay together even though they're not getting along for whatever reason, they're arguing or the musical directions are different. Should a band stay together for the, for the sole purpose of the fans because it's what the fans want? Or should they just go their separate ways for now or for however long, come back again when they want to do it, when they have a united outlook? or united uh, purpose? Well, I guess when it comes to the, the fan, for the bands, it depends on how much money they're gonna make. Yeah. Uh, for us, and everybody can answer this, but for, for me, I think we can tell when the band is just doing it for the money and that they don't, that their heart's not in it. I can, I can tell. <clears throat> so yeah i don't i don't know if there's a right or wrong answer armand though it's just um i i think if a band of the legacy band are continuing on years after they were in their prime maybe they only have a couple original members or hardly any but they're still making music that i yes. like and can listen to <laughs> then uh you know then i'm okay with it but we've seen many instances and i'll have someone else can go next yeah, where no, no, no. it's not the case you know well, you know, the, well, the only reason why I, I ask is because I had a, I had a, um, a very heated discussion <laughs> at, a, at a coffee shop with a, a friend of mine, and it was about Queen and Adam Lambert touring. Okay, now he says that they are basically now a karaoke band. Oh, right. And you know me, Pete. I'm a Queen fanatic. 
Okay. And I said to him, that's not so because you've got two of the two of the members that were still there. They used they had the name Queen before John Deacon joined, you know. So if they want to if they want to tour, if the the if the the want is there to do it, what's the problem? No, no, no. You know, he was just going off on it. So well, can, yeah. I, can I ask a question? How many people in this panel have been in a band? Not in a long time, but yes. So, you know, when you've been in a band for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. it, it really does become like a marriage. There, 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 a lot of fans tend to think of it in a very romantic way. Uh -huh. but it, is, it is essentially a, a relationship between humans. And in, in the case that the band is actually providing for the means of paying your bills, it's a business decision. I mean, the fans pay for these tickets and they pay for these records, but I don't believe the band owes them the fantasy that they're the three musketeers. Mm -hmm. And moreover, mm -hmm. I, I would add that your friend is, is showing incredible disrespect to the, the musicianship of Brian May and Roger Taylor. Bless you. And, and I think that um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just, uh, you know, a band is not just a singer. That's why I thought it was so stupid that people complained. I think Pete did an album, uh, an album, a show on, on it's not the end when the singer leaves. And I completely mm -hmm. agree. Mm -hmm. It's not the end when the singer leaves because, you know, a band is a sum of parts. Okay. A band is, is, and a band can evolve just like people evolve. Like, would you want to be back with your ex just because a lot of people thought you made a great couple? Oh, hell no. So that, that's the kind of thing, right? I, I think that um, we, should, we should view this as a human condition, which is what it is. It's not a fantasy. It's, these are real people with real lives and real problems. And um, in some cases, you know, what you see is the, what happens on stage. You don't see the discussions that happen on the tour bus. You don't see the friction that evolves from being stuck together for such a long time, over and over and over, right? So you're preaching to the converted. Yeah, I think yes. I mean, you, you bring up a good point, Lewis, about this whole romanticized viewpoint. And I think a lot of people, you know, when they're young, when they're growing up, they have their favorite bands and their, their favorite lineup. And then when that's no longer 100% complete, all of a sudden, well, now this you, you can't have this band anymore because the one part is gone. But you, you bring up, they want they have they're taking a living. It's their livelihood, right? Yeah. So, in, in the in the Queen example, it's Queen plus Adam Lambert. Yes, it's and right there on on yeah. the marquee, right? Please. Plus, it's I, I the original guys you. plus this guy who fits in. Who has a great voice? A tradition. That's a great job. Mm -hmm. I got to tell a great, you, great job. Great voice. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I got to tell you, great voice, great stage presence. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not pretty. Nobody can be Freddie. No, oh, I don't know. No, no, no. We even try. No, no, no. I mean, they. I mean, Roger Taylor has said, if you are coming to the show to see a Freddie tribute, don't fucking come. Exactly. Plain yes. and simple. Yes. I have. The last time Queen played in Toronto was August 3rd and 4th, 1982, at the Maple Leaf Gardens, which is no longer there, okay? Mm -hmm. I was 11 years old. I couldn't go. When they announced the tour back in 2014 that they were coming here, I went. I said to Bob, I'm going. Mm -hmm. You can come with me. I'll do whatever I have to do to get to the venue, but I'm going. I saw them again in 2017. We saw them again in 2019. We drove 12 hours to Vancouver. Wow. To see them. Nice. We left at 6 a.m. We got to Vancouver at 6.30 p.m. with the way he drives. Let's go. Wow. Anyway, and we saw it was the opening night on the, on the show, hardcore. on the tour. It was a two hour and 40 minute tour de force. They blasted through the door and they didn't stop for two hours and 40 minutes. They were good. And my thing is, because like I've heard people say, I pity you for touring. Who the hell are you to say I pity you? Exactly. Mm -hmm. For doing that. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, see, I see two different kind of 
situations. The Queen one, who are we to say that Brian May and Roger Taylor can't play these songs? Yeah. You know, if they're going to go out as solo acts, I mean, Roger Taylor's gone out on solo things and ignored Queen altogether, and that's good. Yeah. That's right. He's going to go out under his own name or as the cross or whatever. He should do that. Yeah. But realistically, the fans want to hear those songs. So if they play solo shows, there's pressure to play those songs. So why shouldn't the two of them get together and play those songs under the Queen name? And everyone knows that this is what's going on. You know, I mean, Freddie's not been with us for a long, long time, so yeah. he's not going to be there. So you don't yeah. want to go, you don't want to see it, don't buy a ticket. Exactly. That's as simple as that. However, the other side, I see a band that, not progressive, and Peter knows I've spoken about them before, but the Wild Hearts. So there's four guys. There's a classic lineup of that band. They're on tour as we speak. You read their social media this week, they don't get on. That's quite plainly clear. They're putting that out there. Now there's certain circumstances and you know mental health comes into it and various things like that. There's more going on than, than what I know and what I can talk about. And but they know that if those four guys get together, something special happens. Musically, something special happens. So it's not just for the fans. It's not just saying, well, you know, we'll work together and not like each other or whatever it may be, have our personal differences just so that we sell bigger venues, which they do. But there's also, I think, a recognition from those guys that if you get them in a room, record an album, and then put them out on the road, they're better than they are under any other circumstance. Mm. So there's lots of different kind of levers that get pulled to put a band out on the road. Mm. Yeah. I have a, uh, another bit, um, not to um, slide um, a bit further off, but Smiths. You know, the Smiths um, broke up in 1987, and Morrissey and Johnny Moore couldn't stand each other, despised each other. But yet on the business part, and so these guys, what's that? They just couldn't, the, uh, according to them, and so they were the ones that wrote the music. So uh, the drummer and the bass player, you know, they got 15% shares of whatever they had to divide that amongst themselves while Johnny Marr and Morrissey, what's it, uh, what's it got the whole lion's share of whatever the money that they got in. Now, they have been offered millions to get back together, but Johnny Marr can't stand Morrissey, nor can he stand the other two guys in the band. <laughs> so what's it, they, they looked at it like this. We don't like each other, so why should we play together? You know, whatever we had back then and so, we had it, and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. And then you Richie Blackmore, Ian Gillen situation, right? I mean, yes. If Abba can, re can regroup, then anything is possible. No, but I, I just, my opinion, well, it, it's funny because you, this whole conversation, I mean, we were just talking about yes before, right? And they're right. another perfect example. There are a lot exactly. of people who just are like, all right, this isn't yes anymore. It's like so watered down. And you know, I mean, you could give it some time, the time of day or, or you or not. And I mean, I have been buying every Yes album. I've seen them on tour plenty of times in recent years. I, I mean, honestly, I don't really like the records. I'm going to go out and buy and listen to the new one. I'm going to, you know, give it a fresh take, but I haven't liked anything they've done in years. I haven't liked the last couple of times I've seen them live. I'm just, to me, it's just like, man, is it time for them to just, but Again, like Lewis said, they were banned. They got to make a living. They got to pay the bills. Yep. And people are going to go see him, right? I mean, oh, if you don't like it, you don't go. They're not filling out stadiums like they once did. No. Oh. And they're getting older. They have medical bills. They have issues that they need to deal with, right? Yeah. So, yes, from our perspective, it may seem irresponsibly crazy that what happened to all that cash? I, I can think of a million ways to burn through all that cash. Yep. And that's not going to help them in the present because they have to pay their doctor today yep. and they have to pay their divorces today. So they have to figure that out. I'm not judging. I, I, I have immense respect for these people. They, they, they made my musical DNA. They're, they're a part of my life soundtrack. I, I love their, their work. I don't know. So for the same, I, I've been in a band for 30 years. And I can tell you, it can be very tricky. I've been in multiple bands. The relationships are different in different bands. Sometimes they're very positive. Like with Mike Kud, it's, it's a great thing. Sometimes, you know, it, it can be much more difficult to, to, to get ideas across and, and for everybody to feel happy, right? Unfortunately, none of us live from the band. 
Because mm-hmm. I can only imagine if our, our livelihood depended on the ban, how, mm-hmm. how much more, you know, intense these arguments would become. Sure, sure. Right? So That's I can't thing. judge it because I've never been in those shoes. You know, I can just say it's the fantasy is one thing, but the reality is everybody has to deal with their very concrete problems, right? And that has to come, for, they have to live, their people. You know? Yep, yep. All right, everybody, there you have it. So uh, some, some cool afterthoughts. We, we kind of got off the rails, but that's okay because it was a good discussion. So, um, but Very in the end, time. drama is unanimous. It was a complete shutout tonight. Sorry, Emerson, Lake and Powell, but uh, better luck next time, right? So uh, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us here today. In the comments below, please put your favorite drama or Emerson, Lake and Powell. No right or wrong answer, of course. It all depends on what you like. And uh, I want to thank everybody here for joining today and being part of the discussion. Uh, so uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the all damn the time. time. Uh, make sure Except if you haven't Labor checked Day. out. What's that? Except on Labor Day. Except yesterday. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, the Hudson Valley Squares will be back next Monday. We're going to continue on with the same topic that we were going to do last night. So uh, stay tuned for next Monday where we've got Deep Purple's Come Taste the Band versus Deep Purple Slaves and Masters, two one and done lineups from Deep Purple. And uh, that's the discussion for Monday night. And uh, make sure if you haven't already checked out uh, Neve's uh, YouTube channel. Neve, you want to talk a little bit about what you got coming up on the uh, on Neve the Prog Nerd channel? That's it. Yeah, so talking of bands, um, our band is actually playing this weekend and I'm going to be live streaming the event, hopefully. So if you like, kind of, we're going to be playing a lot of kind of punky kind of things, not much prog because we're not that good yet. Um, I like but, punk. <laughs> yeah, a bit of punk, bit of new wave kind of stuff, um, bit of psychedelic stuff. So if you're interested in that, it's going to be this weekend. Very cool. Can you, can you throw up a link, Pete, for that? Yep. So we can see it. Yeah. That'd be great. Absolutely. Yes, Whatever absolutely. you play, as long as it's sincere, I'm in. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, I'm a bassist as well. So. There you go. Right? As long as it's, you know. Yeah. So, Louis, you were, Louis, you were kind of busy the last couple of weeks down in Mexico. Uh, what did you get oh, to yeah. accomplish while so, you were there? I, I was lucky enough to, to get the call to go back with uh, my friends in the band Luz Herrera. Mm-hmm. Uh, for some of you who know, there's a deep cut, but there used to be a Mexican band called <laughs> Cabeza de Cera. They, they parted, so the, the two brothers remain as Cabezas de Cera, talking about breakups. And the, the sax player left and formed his own band called Luz Riada, and I am the bass player. And um, Edgar, who is the, used to be the sound guy for Cabezas, is now with Luz Riada also. And they wanted to, to put together a, a trio and just do some songwriting and come up with a, like, on the spot, just the, the basic ideas for an album, which we did. I'd never done that before. Just sit there and jam and more of a compose and I, I get it together. But mm-hmm. but um, we did that for a week. We just, I, had, I hadn't had the experience of just playing bass and doing nothing else for eight to nine hours a day. And it was absolutely glorious. And go, we man. came up mm-hmm. with seven songs. So this is, this is good times. Cool. Mm-hmm. We, I don't know when the album will be ready because now we need an obsess to actually record we, we finished, like we recorded drums and bass and everything afterward mm-hmm. with the studio, that it's all done. We still need to get Ramses to come in and do his parts. And then there's one more song that's actually going to be composed. Okay. It's a longer piece and then it'll be out. So I'm looking forward to that. No cheesy synths. <laughs> no, there are no synths. There's only bass, sax and drums. Excellent. And most importantly, people, no softies. No, no softies. softies. <laughs> no softies. <laughs> Fucking softies. <laughs> that's, that's, that does nobody any good. Right? <laughs> Very cool. So uh, what else we got coming up on the channel? So uh, tomorrow, Mr. Reed, along with Simon Bray and myself, will be ranking the catalog of Cats in Space. You don't know who Cats in Space are. Really cool band from the UK who, Stephen, you want to describe them? Uh, I, I can never describe these guys. Oh, wow. Well, well, I mean, they kind of do everything, don't they? They're very 70s inspired. Uh, they incorporate lots of pop into their sound, but it's the kind of 70s pop that we all, you know, really liked. There's bits of 10cc, there's lots of vocal harmonies, but they've got big riffs and catchy choruses, and they've got four albums, and they're absolutely fantastic. And it's going to be really really difficult to rank those albums yeah 
If you like, if you like 10 CC, City Boy, Queen, Sticks, Sparks. that sort of thing, that's what yeah. you get, uh, and and a lot more. So a uh, really, really cool band. And uh, what else? Uh, Thursday, the Monsters Den, Friday morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff and myself. And then Sunday, we've got uh, album homework assignment with uh, Bryce from Bryce Talks Metal and Sydney Taylor from the Hudson Valley Square. So that's coming up on Sunday. And then hopefully the following week, Mr. Lewis Nasser and Chris Allo are going to square off in the next uh, next homework album homework assignment episode. So that's coming up and a lot more on the channel. So thanks for everybody for watching. For Chuck and Neve and Armando and Steven and Lewis and Eric and George, I am Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thursday.